Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Um, Wes and our wonderful clergy team together in our favorite space, the Gan Chapel at Temple Emmanuel. We are taping this class on Wednesday, February the 28th. And this class, dear colleagues and dear friends online, is a treat. It's a different kind of class. The last few classes have been about Israel and all of the complexities, which are obviously so painful in Israel. This is a different class. This is about America and American Judaism. It's about changes in American Judaism, and it's prompted by the article that Shura Telushkin wrote in the tablet that came out on February 12th called The New American Judaism. And I knew that this class was inevitable when a half a dozen colleagues uh, or uh, congregants sent this piece to me uh, pretty much the day it came out. Very evocative piece, so looking forward to talking about her assessment of American Judaism, where it's been and where it's going. So let's thank God for the gift of learning Torah together. Baharevna Adonai Eloheinu, and Divrei Toratcha Bafinu, Ubafi Amcha Bei Yisrael, Benihia Anachnu Tzatzaeinu Ritzatzae Amcha Bei Yisrael, Kulani Yodei Shemecha, Vulamdei Toratecha Lishma, Baruch Hata Adonai, Hamilamei Torah Lama Yisrael, Baruch Hata Adonai, Elohim Malach Olam, Asher Bacharbanu Mikol Hamim, Benatan Lanu and Toratel, <laughs> so, um, dear colleagues, when we have a 102 degree fever, 103 degree fever, that is a, a symptom of some systemic problem that's going on in our body. Uh, when we get in our car and we turn on the ignition and it doesn't work, it's usually not the key's fault, and it's usually not the ignition's fault, it's there's some issue, a systemic issue in our car. And Shira Telushkin's uh, point of departure is that there is a great rabbi shortage. And we know that there is a great rabbi shortage. We know that for the last several years, from the pandemic through now, uh, there are not enough rabbis to go around, um, particularly in the non-Orthodox world. There's not an, there are conservative synagogues that cannot find rabbis. There are reform synagogues that cannot find rabbis. She begins her story with a, a big reform synagogue that's always had rabbis. Uh, their rabbi retires post-pandemic. Uh, he actually hangs on longer than he would have wanted to to tide the synagogue over, and yet um, when he finally retires later than he wanted, the congregation cannot find a rabbi, and this has not happened. And in the end, they get a fee-for-service rabbi, somebody who comes and gives a sermon for a price, somebody who comes and does shachar to Musa for a price, but isn't really a pastor, doesn't really go to visit the hospitals, doesn't uh, shoulder to shoulder with the congregation on their strategic issues, doesn't do board meetings, fee-for-service. And that's the 102-degree fever. Um, why the great rabbi shortage? And she uses that as a, as a prism to try to understand what is going on with American Judaism. So here's my question to you. Let's imagine that you are talking to a friend uh, who hasn't read the article, and they say, hey, what's her analysis? What did she say? What would you take away? What is her analysis of what's behind the great rabbi shortage? I think the rabbi should go first. <laughs> <laughs> the rabbi should go first. So Michelle or Elisa, what, what, was her, what was her analysis? Like, why does she think there's a great rabbi shortage all of a sudden in the last few years? There's a pop quiz on who did their homework. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to talk at you, but uh, if, instead of me talking at you, um, I'd love your thoughts. I actually see a few factors that she pulls out. Um, one is the, the work has always been nonstop. Um, but there was a level of meaning and um, and and content that was brought out that for folks that gave them an opportunity to say, well, I'll make some sacrifices in order to be able to do this. But in she points out in the era of therapists and in the era of um, you know people who are able to professionally go and seek the kind of learning that they could seek from other organizations, namely organizations uh, that are innovative like Hadar and Hartman and places like that that have 
offered learning and content uh, in a, a new dynamic way, that they're no longer necessarily seeking that within their home synagogue, thus um, depriving the, the young people who are looking at going into the rabbinate of, of the question of, is this just a job? Right. Um, do I have the same niche that I didn't have? There's the problem that has always existed, which is that in the middle of the country, when you're going to a place where there are fewer Jewish resources, I don't think it's a new thing that it's hard to bring. Um, rabbis are, by definition, um, really committed to uh, deep and rich and wide Jewish lives, especially for their children. The Chabad ethos of I'm going to go out to the plains and, and set something up is not necessarily as present within the liberal movements. Um, and then she also points out the, the challenge of the um, explaining Judaism. You have to be a salesman now right. and then there's finally I, I don't know finally maybe there's a couple more points that she makes but there's also the the competition right you could uh, if you're emerging from school you might want to go into investment banking right you might right. there there are the yeah. same competition uh challenges that are on every profession okay, so let there, me, are, there let are also me. two more that i, I yeah find Mahara, we'll get to those but i want to because michelle just offered up a bunch and i want to just Take them. You 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 offered a lot, many of the factors she she offered, and I want to double click on it. Okay, so one is uh, one of the things that you mentioned that she says she she quotes David Wolpe, who quotes Simon Greenberg, who was a great teacher, who said Simon Greenberg taught David Wolpe, young David Wolpe, in the ni early 1980s. Um, you have congregants who are American Jews. Uh, they uh, profoundly get Judaism. Uh, they just don't know how to be American. And your job as a rabbi is to teach them how to take their Judaism and live it in America. And David points out in this article, that's not the world today. We have people who get America. The issue is not that they get America, they get America. They just don't get or that care that much about being Jewish. And so one of the issues that, that Sher Telushkin points out is it's just kind of frustrating for rabbis and clergy of all kinds to try to teach Judaism, you're kind of selling a product that a lot of people just aren't that interested in, and that that is a demoralizing. That's one of her pieces. That's the, that was the point of the David Wolpe quote. Uh, they get America, they don't get Judaism, and they don't care that much about Judaism. And then to your point, if they do care about Judaism, there are sleeker, sexier options like Hadar or Hartman than a suburban synagogue. Um, so let me ask you, have you, do you encounter that? In other words, the, um, the, the challenge of, of, a, of a constituent base that is not that interested in what we do. Does that resonate for you? Yeah, it, it, it does for me. I was thinking that, you know, one of the things that, that came up in the article is the idea that, um, that people don't grow up in a Jewish setting at home. Like, when, you know, when I was a kid growing up, there was nothing that wasn't Jewish about my, about my, about my, my, uh, my, my home life, you know, uh, kept kosher, kept Shabbat, all the social events were all, you know, USY. Um, it was a uh, thick, it was, it, it was, was a thick, thick Jewish thick, culture. Right? So, um, so if, so if, so if someone would have said to me, um, you know, at that, uh, at some point when I was in my, like, you know, late, uh, late teens, would you consider the rabbinate? It, it would, it would, it may have made some sense, right? Which it did for my twin brother, right? So, um, but when people grow up in homes in which Judaism is not part of their lives, then um, to, then to choose the rabbinate, uh, to be brought into the idea of becoming a rabbi, I think it makes it it makes it harder, right. um, because you have to you, yeah, you, you have to start from, you have to sort of start from the beginning. Um, like like in in my years at uh, Hebrew College, I've always been very surprised by many of this, the rabbinical students whose, whose basic Jewish knowledge um, seemed, uh, seemed to be really quite low. Not Alisa. Um, yeah. So. Hmm? Not Alisa. <laughs> no, no, Thank you. no, 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 Def <laughs> definitely not, definitely not Alisa, definitely not Alisa, but, but some, uh, not, yeah, but I mean, not, that, that was one of my points that I was going to yeah. say before, uh, which is, um, you know, we've seen in the last 20 years or so how, you know, the kids we have here in religious school, not to generalize, but, you know, the, the, they struggle with Hebrew, perhaps more than in, in previous times. And it's, it's hard to see, you know, that trajectory 
from, from this to becoming rabbis and be proficients in Hebrew and Talmud and Mishnah. And so it's, it's a, one of the reasons is that, that it's such a long mountain to climb, right? Right. right. In other words, put it this way, you know, when, when Stephen Greenblatt teaches here, you know, um, and he, he talks about going to a Hebrew school back in the day, um, uh, four days a week. And then four days a week became three days a week. And then three days a week became two days a week, shorter hours, et cetera, et cetera. There's just less, th less of, and so it's thinner than thicker. Um, and that's pretty much across the board in non-Orthodox settings. Um, and so that, that creates the longer mountain, if you want to go from that to the rabbinate. And then just to also add, Michelle, your point that let's say you're a person who wants to go into the helping profession or the healing profession, um, and I don't, you know, I don't read Hebrew, and I don't know from Mishnah, and I don't know from Talmud, and I don't really have a tradition of going to shul every Shabbos and all this God stuff and all this religion stuff, and all these services stuff, and, but I want to help people, I could become a therapist. Um, or I could become, a, you know, there's any number of other fields where you could go into, <laughs> I could go into nursing, I could go become a doctor, I could, there's other things I could do that would allow me to help people without having to encounter a whole foreign world of Judaica that's never really been my thing. Aliza. So I, I see it a little differently. One, I don't necessarily think that exposure is the only reason that people go into the rabbinate. And in fact, being at Hebrew college and seeing so many people, including people that grew up totally secularly and then heard a call, like a literal call. And we're like, I'm going to rabbinical school. And their families were like, are you crazy? You're going to rabbinical school? I mean, I also see it. I'm working with a conversion student right now who, um, uh, is is partnered with somebody who's a totally secular Jew, totally secular Jew, and it's really important for both of them that this partner become Jewish. And I ask the question, like, why? Why do like you you're you're not into religion? You don't do religion. You do culture. What, what's the point? Why are you interested in that? And the answer was because it means something to me, and that that it means something to me, I think, is much deeper than we give it credit for. Also, think about the exposure that kids get to any career path. There's very little exposure. We don't, kids don't see people functioning in the world. I mean, they see doctors and they see, you know, there's a few professions that they see more. They see teachers, they see, but, but the way that we find our paths, I don't think necessarily only has to do with what is modeled for us. Right. And so I, I think, think there's I something think separate. I want to say a couple of things. First of all, I'm, I'm very upset with this article <laughs> doesn't mention at all yes. the word Hunters. Hazan or Cantor yeah. yes. at all. Okay. And we are, we are facing pretty much the same thing. There are, I checked yesterday, not because I want to leave, uh, just to be prepared for this class. There are 30 synagogues in America looking for a conservative Hazan. 30. 30. 30. The currently in placement, there are 30. And I know for a fact. There how many? 10? Well, there's 30 congregations looking. Looking. Yeah. And how many are available? Cantors. cantors. Yeah. I don't know. But I, what I know is that there are cantors who retire after 30, 20, 30 years and they, the synagogues cannot find replacements. Cannot replace them. Okay. So, but one thing, one thing, at least I want to mention. So I had, the, I had the honor of teaching many years at Hebrew College. Didn't have the honor to tutor you. Um, you didn't need any tutor. I but did, and but anyway. <laughs> so, and I was really surprised by the majority of the cantorial students that I had. Not, not all, but the cantorial students, the majority. They were so skillful in music and in in singing, but their Hebrew level was terrible, really terrible. And again, in the same way that you know somebody may consider going to other professions of healing people, same people may consider going on Broadway, going on you know singing popular music, going on opera because they don't have to deal with with learning a language. So 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 I think all of this is so so point one here is that um, that. The American Jewish community um, has less content uh, it, that it's that, that our, our, the rising generation just is exposed to less content, a thinner thing. You know, it's the Simon Greenberg point uh, that David won't be transformed. This current generation gets America; they don't get Jewish, and therefore that creates a longer road, etc. Um, she po also points out a few other things that I wanted to, to offer up. Um, one is, and this was her word, that things are just much more contentious now. Uh, Israel, contentious now. Politics, contentious now. Um, and she also brings up intermarriage. Uh, in the non-Orthodox world, 70, 7 out of 10 
seven out of 10 Jews in the non-Orthodox world who are getting married are marrying partners who are not Jewish. And that creates a lot of complexity for legacy institutions like our own and, and clergy who adhere to policies that are traditional. Um, and so she, she offers that up, contentiousness, politics, Israel, intermarriage, as reasons perhaps there could be fewer rabbis and cantors coming up. What are your thoughts about that? So I strongly disagree on that point. One, because I feel like she's coming from a particular conservative background that that is not a challenge that's faced by our reform colleagues. They don't have the challenge of intermarriage. They, they have the are, challenge of Israel they and have they the have challenge the challenge of, Israel, of politics. There are also plenty of congregations who have come out as anti-Israel congregations. I, I think that it's, it's a real thing that sometimes congregations are aligning around politics, aligning around Israel in wh however they form. I don't necessarily think that contentiousness is what prevents people from going into the rabbinate, nor do I think that um, people know at the outset what they're getting into when you go to rabbinical school. I feel like most people don't have as clear of a sense of what, what they're merging to, and certainly the majority of students now who are going into rabbinical school are starting out against congregations, not necessarily because of contentiousness, the, the words that I hear most often are work-life balance. The thing I hear most often is, I wanna have two days off. I wanna have two shared days off with my partner. I wanna have my nights and weekends. And I they think- think you can't get that in a congregation? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Tuna salad is wonderful. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that is what I hear more often than in anything. And I think also, to me, can we just double click on that? That is just so interesting that, um, that you know, my, when my father-in-law's generation uh, was ordained, when Rabbi Chill's generation was ordained, it was just obvious that the vast majority of, of people would go into pulpits. Mm -hmm. They didn't call them congregations, they called them pulpits, pulpit rabbi, that's their, their idiom. Uh, I was ordained in 98. The strong majority of my fellow classmates from the seminary went into congregations, right? And what's so interesting now is, and she points out, that, that fewer than half go to congregations, they go to Hill, et cetera, et cetera. Can we just double click on what does it say about life, the human condition, human beings, us, our colleagues, our younger colleagues, that people are choosing not to do congregational work because they want more time off? It's just interesting to me. Well, there's also another dynamic that I think is really important to mention. The majority of rabbinical students were going into pulpits at a time when the majority of partners were staying at home. And I think that makes a huge difference. If you have two working parents, then that means you're really pressed. It means that you're constantly in motion. It means that you're constantly figuring out who's working, who's with the kids and who's at home. And I have this evening program. Well, I have an evening program. What are you doing? It's just a constant dynamic that you have to navigate. Whereas 50 years ago, if you have a stay at home parent, it doesn't matter. If you work six days, it doesn't matter. The, the mom can bring the kids to the shul and they can have a lovely time together and the mom can be at home every, if you have evening meetings. That was my mother so and Alisa, my wife. Alisa, I mean, a that question was my wife growing up. Alisa, a question really for you different. and for Michelle. Right. Do you think that the inclusion of women rabbi in the rabbinate and the cantorate that has you know, accelerated that? that? So I, I don't think necessarily it's about women. I think it's about two working parent households. And I think that we have not evolved the rabbinate. There's a reason why more and more people are choosing not congregational work. Why? Because if you work at an organization, you have a limited, you have a 40 hour work week and you have clear designated hours at the beginning of the week and it's dependable and it's reliable and you can build, I mean, it feels to me like the challenge is not, it's not these people that are not smart enough to get why not why they should go to the pulpit. It's that we haven't evolved the pulpit. And add to that, a lot of the people that are growing up into this world, emerging into rabbinical school, grew up in a curated Jewish world. They were sent off to Jewish camp, which was organized around their needs and organized around their wants. And it was all about building a Judaism just for them. So it's no surprise that now they're, they're building a Judaism that's just for them, that meets their needs. It's not about going into establishment. It's about going out and creating something new. So imagine, I, imagine all that plus having four kids. I literally cannot. I can barely manage with one. Like, I just don't. <laughs> so, Michelle Robinson, speaking of which, um, what's your voice here? Um, I, I'm sort of reflecting back on the question of um, women in the rabbinate, and I think that um, you need a, an institution that's willing 
to um, to provide the kind of support and and balance and colleagues. I think it's it would be very hard to be a solo rabbi in Missouri um, and try to raise a family. Mm. So it's interesting. So what I hear you saying, the the energy of this conversation is. It's not about politics and Donald Trump and Joe Biden and Israel and Netanyahu, not Netanyahu and Gaza and Israel. It's not about that, less about that. Um, it's also, it sounds like we haven't mentioned it yet, but it's less about denominationalism. I mean, she makes the point that denominations are basically dead. It just, you know, the New York institutions don't know it, but all their members know. Um, and she quotes the rabbi who says, I don't think there's been, I've been a rabbi of a reform synagogue for 30 years. I don't think a single member has joined because of reform ideology. Um, it's not about the eclipse of denominations. It's about the changes of, of family, work-life balance, economics. So you think that's what, what drives it? I, yeah, and I don't know that it's not. I, I actually think, you know, one of the reasons I started out with my book report here for right. you, because one of the things I was struck by her article is how very many reasons <laughs> she brings in. And I, I think she's probably right that it's not any one of those. It's the confluence of all of them together. Well, when... I mean, okay, when, when yeah, so let me ask you this question. Um, I want to step back. A lot of reasons that we've mentioned, most of them, actually, I think we've mentioned pretty much the all the of cost them. the cost of pain the for the a cost, long. right? The logistics. I have a son in New York studying at JTS, and I know what the cost right. means. <laughs> hey, Do you want to share about how that makes you feel? <laughs> Could you just say where before before we before we zoom out, and and I, I want to ask the question in a minute about is she calls her article the New American Judaism which means necessarily there's an older American Judaism. You know, it's Dor Holech Vidor Ba, an old Judaism dies, a new Judaism comes, is given birth, um, which means also she's having an implicit, if not explicit, critique of an institution like Temple Emanuel that you know, was created in the 1930s. We are a legacy institution. Um, uh, and a question I want to ask is, what is she saying about Temple Emanuel? What is she saying about legacy institutions? What is she saying about what Judaism has had to die so that a new American Judaism can get born? And is she basically optimistic or not optimistic about the future? But before we get there, could you guys just say a word about cool, sleek, new models like Hadar and Hartman and Pop-Up Minyanim and Moshe House, and all this other cool 20-something stuff and 30-something stuff, and what gives it oxygen, and where is its place in the Jewish ecosystem? Well, I think I've seen some kind of, um, in, in my old years here in America, kind of observing. I, I come from a Jewish tradition that the synagogue clergy are pretty much the only people who lead services. Right, you train kids to do it. They do it at the bar mitzvah. So eventually, they You're do it. You're talking about Argentina. About, it's yeah, just yeah. Clergy in South America, it. mostly, you know. Right. And, and still in synagogues in Europe, is this is that the model? The model here is different. The model here is you train people for them to have the ability to do it. Right. So that is the reason Minyan Maor exists. That we have the Chapel Minyan. That we have the Ashkama Minyan where our own members are capable of chanting and reading and they're even, empowered. Yes, that's right. They're empowered. So. With that, I'm asking, I'm, I'm thinking out loud, if that it's one of the reasons that is not mentioned here, that since people have the ability of doing that, and they have other passions, why would they go to cantorial and rabbinical school if they can come in a place like this and lead services? Well, I think, I think the, there, is, there is an important point that's brought up, I think, early in the article, is that you know, these congregations that have um, the you know, rabbis for fee, uh, is that when someone's in the hospital and they need that comforting phone call, this, there isn't a rabbi or someone that they know uh, to make that phone call, to make, to make that visit. Um, you know, someone's going to come and do a wedding. It's, it's not a rabbi that they know. It's not a person that they know they have had a relationship with. And that, that relationship, I think, is really, really, really sig uh, s significant uh, in terms of... Uh, in no, terms but, of but the, my the, point is a little different then. My point is that when I was growing up, and I went to cantorial concerts, I said, I want to be like them. Right. And the only possibility that I had of being like them is going to cantorial school and have my own pulpit. Mm -hmm. It's not that I could come to temple right. and, and practice and do Right, but with a, with a participatory minion like Minyan Ma'or that we have, or pop-up minion name throughout the world, etc., um, 
or and let's say your passion is learning. You go to Hadar for a week, etc. Um, you just have other options to keep your day job and also give expression to your Jewish passions in, in, in prayer or in, in learning, etc. Um, so, so here's my question. Um, it, would you say that her article uh, about forget, we'll put temple management to the side and legacy institutions to the side, but it's called the New American Judaism. Would you say that her article is fundamentally optimistic or, or not optimistic about Judaism. I mean, she, she's saying that there's not enough rabbis to go around, uh, but maybe that's just our issue or synagogue's issue. But how is Judaism as a whole faring in this country as she sees it? I mean, she offers a, a sort of a lovely little Haftorah note here at the end. You know, she talks about rabbinical school students who said they don't want to work in a congregation, then they're exposed to the congregation, and by being exposed, they fall in love. I mean, I myself am a category of that. When I went to rabbinical school, I thought I was going to go on and get a PhD in Talmud. I was going to be a teacher. I was, I didn't have a draw to the synagogue. I, you know, met, came to Temple Emmanuel, met Temple Emmanuel, fell in love, and this has been just such an uh, amazing and powerful and and so inspiring of uh, work every single day in my life because this place is so special and it helped me learn how much I love it but I didn't know that when I set out mm -hmm. um, and I think she makes a really beautiful point that we have to expose kids to Elisa's point, right? We probably have to expose kids to lots of different kinds of professions and lives and seeing what they could do and what they could become in, in the world. And maybe we need more internships in, in synagogue life, not, not less participation, but more participation from our kids so that they could come to see what it would look like to serve in a congregation and mm. the kind of joy and blessing and fulfillment that that brings every day. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. There was uh, someone, someone that I taught here for bar mitzvah many years ago who was looking for something to do in the summer. So he did an internship with me. I showed him the ropes of, you know, what daily minion was like, what, um, what the minutia of what, what I do was like. And that person um, who, who eventually got into medical school, started medical school and said, wait a minute, you know what? I was more inspired when I was doing this kind of thing, became a cantor and then eventually became a cantor and a rabbi. It's like very odd. But um, maybe not odd, but, um, but there was a really that kind of inspiration, uh, that personal inspiration. I think that was really, uh, really an interesting uh, scenario for that particular person. Yeah. I Lisa, also do, think you see, do you see her being optimistic or not optimistic about the new American Judaism? I, I don't, I think the title of her article is misleading. I don't think she's talking about the new American Judaism. I think she's talking about uh, the old American Judaism and what might happen, but I don't think she's gotten there because even the, as you say, the sleek new modes that she talks about are missing key parts. If you're active in Hadar, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a rabbi that's able to do a funeral or be there to visit you in the hospital. And if you're active in a lot of these, uh, you know, pop-up organizations, they provide one, you know, they provide a place to go sing, they provide a place to be, but they don't necessarily provide the whole community experience. And I think that the the rising work of our next generation is figuring out how do you blend the the idea I want a curated personally relevant meaningful Jewish experience and I want a stable legacy community to hold me I actually want that structure and security and it's you know this is alongside the reality of many young adults whose lives don't feel as quite as stable as I think older generations did. They don't have the possibility of, of buying a home and having the same job for 40 years and, and building roots. That's not a part of our lives now. So it makes sense to me that, that everything is becoming less stable and more uprooted and more transient. And so the question is, do we want that for Judaism? Do we want to have transient pop-up dynamic community or do we want to have stable community that has strong roots and an ability to grow in dynamic ways? This is essentially 
uh, Judaism in climate change and how do we become more resilient and build resilient communities? So let me build off your thing with a, a last question to bring us home. Um, what does Temple Emmanuel need to do to adapt, to evolve, to change, to continue to thrive in this new climate so that we can continue to be here, a place of stability and anchoring and also relevance in a new world? I think we're doing, doing it. it. I just want to say, I, I, I really firmly believe that we're doing it. And, and this happens when we have... So say um, more. Like, what are we like doing? We have a taste of Shabbat Alive dinner. We have 143 people that come once a month for dinner for zero to five and their families. We have Yisod. We have classes literally every day of the week. We have a podcast. And many, many of you are probably listening to this on your phones as you're going about your day. We're live streaming. We're meeting people where they need us to be. We're going to the hospital. We're doing the life cycle rituals, but we're also providing the comfort and security of a place that has history, that has roots. And I think that we as a team are modeling um, a kind of connection that, that, that we're all hungry for. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you, Alisa. And uh, I think that one thing that is not mentioned in the article, uh, or more, two things. The first one is I, I believe that the article focuses more on perhaps in the future that the rabbinical and cantorial schools, well, only rabbinical schools, will die, all right? In the modern liberal movement, it won't longer be the case. But go back in history, go back centuries ago, go back to the rabbis of the Talmud, the rabbis of the mission. Did they go to rabbinical school in those days? They didn't, you know? And the greatest generation of Hazanim, they didn't go to cantorial school. They learned with somebody, they got, you know, they got ready with somebody who was their mentor, and they prepared them for the leadership of the synagogue. That was the leadership of synagogues for centuries. I'm not that concerned about the, the you know, if that is the case. And, and if, to answer your question, Wes, I believe that there will always be clergy that will be ready to work in a place like Emmanuel, which mm -hmm. is the greatest synagogue in the world. Yeah, but yeah. also because, <laughs> because I think that won't change, regardless of how they get trained. There will always be leaders, you know, clergy and synagogues. Uh, Dan or I, Michelle, I, any I, last comments? Yeah, I just want to add this. So I, I, I'm also in agreement with, with Eliza that we are doing it. And we're also offering that combination, you know, with, with, by having Minyan Ma'or and a Hashkama Minyan um, and our Chapel Minyan, that, we're, that, we're having, that, we have the, that we do both, that we have um, empowerment of lay people to lead services while simultaneously having the um, the extraordinary expert skills of all of you guys um, that that's available to the congregation that and that we also have the um, the ability with um, you know with having all, all of us here to um, to connect uh, personally with with our membership so that when people are in um, either in moments of crisis or joy that we are that we are there and we are trained to be there mm. and I, I think probably yes and I believe very strongly we're doing it and I also believe very strongly that there is much more work to do mm -hmm. I think one of the best things that we're doing is partnering with the organizations like Hadar like Hartman um, we have uh, an incre we have incredible lay leaders like Amy Klein, who is constantly saying, hey, do you find a teenager to right. send to the Hartman program? How do we get our kids more engaged, more involved? It's, it's a group effort. Yeah. It is an unceasing effort. We all need to work at it every single day. Every member of this congregation, not just the clergy, we need to be moving together towards a world where both the the old and the new Judaism become one and the same, where our legacy institution is not only an institution that has existed, but that we know will continue to exist for generations because we're providing new meaning, new import, and new opportunities for engagement every day. Yeah. Thank you, guys. So I just want to end. I'm actually going to get up for a second so uh, that uh, Andrew can show a picture of the uh, ark in the Gantt Chapel. And I want to end with a little story about the ark in the Gantt Chapel because it brings together old and new. Um, there's a, a lovely man in our shul who's coming to Minion now every night. 
his wife of many, many years passed away recently, and he sang Kaddish for her. And he observed that they got married in the old building by Rabbi Chill, and they got married in the presence of that ark. And when he thinks about that ark, he thinks about the greatest day in his life, which made the rest of his life possible, the covenantal moment where he and his lifelong love stood under the chuppah with Rabbi Chill at Temple Emmanuel. And now God has called her to be with God. And he comes to Minyan every night. And from the old building, you know, I think the windows are still here in the Gan Chapel. And this ark, uh, which used to be in the sanctuary of the old building, is here in the Gan Chapel. And he sees this chapel every night. And he says, Ikadavi Kadash Rabbah. And he's looking at the chapel, which he first looked at when he and his wife stood under the chuppah 40 years ago. That's, that's what's at stake in healthy shuls. In a world of change, it gives us centering and grounding and the will to continue to live and to affirm life. That's why we need shuls. That's why we need rabbis and Elias. That's why we need cantors. <laughs> Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.